Hello, uh, this is my project, a trip down memory lane. Um, my name is Russ Mim. Um, this is the final project for CSCI E29 for fall 2020. We're going to dive into the memory allocation of Python and build a visualization tool. So, but first, a little bit about me. Uh, here's me and my family. I've got two daughters and a beautiful wife. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer by trade. I work for Ford Motor Company as a airbag and restraints engineer. And I'm pursuing my master's um, in data science at Harvard Extension School. Uh, so Python and memory management. Where did I get the idea from? Where did this come from? Uh, and I always kept wondering, you know, what is a stack overflow? Everyone knows what a stack overflow is, but what is a stack overflow? <clears throat> so definition. Program attempts to use more memory space than is available on the call stack. It's said to overflow. And it typically results in a program crash. Okay, what does that mean? Let's dig a little deeper. But now I'm interested. You know, what is, what's going on under the hood in terms of memory? What's this call stack thing? What is it? You know, what actually is a stack overflow? What what is what's going on here? Uh, how, how does Python store or allocate variables, functions, arrays, etc.? You know, what what's occurring as my program runs when a function is called, when a variable is called, when you know when an object is generated? What's actually happening? And how about other languages? How do other languages handle memory allocation? C or Java, for example. We'll start right off with the Python memory manager, the PMM. And there's a lot of documentation on this. I you know, highly suggest you know, digging into it for even deeper understanding. But essentially, it does all the dirty work so we don't have to. Uh, things like garbage collection, reference counting, uh, stack and heap allocation. These all occur automatically behind the scenes uh, with the Python C API. So garbage collection, it essentially removes objects that are no longer being referenced to or being used to prevent them from consuming valuable heap space um, for your program. Java has a similar manager, um, like the Java Virtual Machine. It also includes garbage collection, uh, but the heap is structured a little bit differently. Um, and then we get into languages like C that require manual uh, or active garbage collection and, and heap allocation. So the programmer, the user must uh, code in if they want to send an object to the heap or not, and if they want to deallocate it. And we'll show that a little bit later in, in a little bit more detail. But let's walk through some examples of how the PMM functions. So what is memory? We have RAM, our random access memory on the computer. So more programs you need to run, the more RAM you need or the more RAM you want. Um, so in the context of, of the Python um, environment, we have uh, at the low address and the high address. So low being at the other uh, with initialized or uninitialized data, text, things like that. At the high address, we have command line arguments, environmental variables, and things like that. But we heard this term before. We've heard about the call stack. This is where function calls and variables uh, live for a brief period of time while they're referencing some object in the heap. And that's what it's responsible for up here. And we'll break this down further as we go. The heap, on the other hand, is where objects, like strings, integers, arrays, whatever, um, that's where they live. And it's responsible for storing all those objects and values as a program runs. And they eventually they, they converge towards each other, like these arrows indicate. So let's take it a little bit deeper. So at the start of a program, the operating system allocates a predetermined stack size uh, for, for the stack. So Python is typically two megabytes. That size does not change. Application can't request any more memory for the stack. It's, it's said to be static. It, you get two megabytes and that's it. Um, the heap, on the other hand, is considered the, the free pool of memory and is dynamic. So objects can be allocated and deallocated de at will during the program, and it's limited only by the system memory. But you have to be, you know, be careful. If you if you overload the heap or exceed the size of the heap allocation, um, you can get a, a memory error error, as I show here. For the stack, we have what are called stack frames, and they are last in, first out. So say a function is called, it gets added to the top of the stack, the top of the call stack. When it's finished running, it's popped from the stack. So it lives 
for the time that it's running, and then it's popped out of that stack memory. Uh, when we get into garbage collection, uh, that ensures objects with no references to them are cleaned up from the heap. So we'll show a breakdown of this. But essentially, you don't want things called dangling uh, pointers, where we have an object in the stack re referencing something uh, in the heap that is no longer being used or referenced in the program. It's just sitting there consuming memory. And the garbage collector gets rid of that for us in Python. So a simple example is we just have four variables, x, y, w, 1, w, 2. <clears throat> so first, if, you know, we, we push, you know, once we, we quote unquote run this, uh, we have memory allocated in the heap for the in streamed objects. Of, so five and hello show up in the heap, they're allocated. The variables x, y, w1, and w2 hold references to them. So you see them show up here in the stack with their addresses. You can see x and y are identical addresses, and so are w1 and w2. That's because they're referencing the same object in the heap. We don't have independent addresses because they're calling the same exact object, just different variables. <clears throat> but what if we change the references? What if we change y to 6 and w2 to goodbye? So let's do that. y equals 6 now, and w2 equals goodbye. So now y is pointing to 6 and not 5, and w2 is pointing to goodbye instead of hello. We get new objects allocated in the heap memory, and then they're going to get new memory addresses in the stack. So 6 pops into the heap. Goodbye shows up in the heap. And you see that the y address now changes. It is not identical to x anymore, and it's new, referencing the object 6 in the heap. Same with w2. It's not identical to w1 anymore because it references goodbye and not hello. So now we have four unique addresses and four unique heap objects. But if we take this full circle and, and change x and w1 as well. So now we're going to make x equal to y, and we're going to make w1 equal to w2. <clears throat> so now x nor y reference the object 5 in the heap and w1 nor w2 reference hello in the heap. Enter the garbage collector. The reference count to objects five and hello have now dropped to zero. There's nothing that references those two objects. So the garbage collector sees this and deallocates them from the heap memory, as shown. So now only six and goodbye live in the heap. We freed up memory uh, in the heap for, to, for something else later down the line. Uh, at the same time in the stack, the Address for x now mirrors the address for y because they point to the same object of 6 in the heap. And same for w1. It mirrors the w2 address because it also points to the same object of goodbye. So we can also prove this out using id uh, in, in Python. So we'll run some really simple examples here. Uh, just like we showed. So example 1, we have x, x and y equal to 5, w1, w2 equal to hello. You can see, as we indicated, their addresses, their reference addresses, are identical because they point to the same object. When we do example 2 and we switch it up, change y and change w2, we also see that now we have four unique memory addresses, as we predicted. In example 3, when we brought it full circle and, changed, and made it so that x is now also pointing to the same object as y, same for w1, we got what we would expect. We have memory addresses that are identical because they point to the same objects, six and goodbye. And we know in the back end, the garbage collector has removed five and hello from the heap. And we can also do a step-by-step -step example with a function call. So a simple function here, we have func a, b uh, with local variables x, y, and z in it, and a print function outside. So first, the function a, b is pushed to the stack while it runs. It gets pushed to the call stack in its own uh, stack frame. Local variables x, y, and z are also included in that function call stack frame, as I show. And the values of x and y are allocated in the heap. So we have two and three uh, integer objects. So, And they start to converge towards one another. The next step, we have this outside user input for args a and b, that's so one and two. Um, so now variable z can be calculated and returned in this stack frame. Z equals 12 is allocated in the heap. It gets its own uh, reference memory address, as I show here. And Z is returned. The 
the print function is then called for that function um, and return and it prints 12 the return of, of the function and finally after all that is done running so the function is completed that means like we stated before if the function is done it gets popped from the stack so print gets popped first because it was the last one in it gets removed from the stack and then the, the actual function itself gets popped from the stack uh, call stack so now the, the stack is empty the function the com program is completed there's nothing left there and the garbage collector came through and cleared out the heap uh, memory because there's no more references to any of those objects 2 3 or 12 that once existed there while the function was running so function is done the program is done everything's cleaned out and now we can compare python to c so i'll go through this table here <clears throat> So we have code in Python x equal to five, and in C we have to statically declare int x equals five. In Python we don't need to do that. We know that that's a, an integer object. So what is integer five? It's an integer object allocated on the heap with a reference address to it in the stack. C is this primitive data. What is variable x? That is a stack memory reference address pointing to an energy object, integer object equal to five in the heap. Whereas in C, the user has to declare where it's allocated with malloc, realloc, and free, and we'll show an example of that later. What occurs when x equals x plus 1? So just like we showed, if we change what uh, x is pointing to, and we change the, the object that it's pointing to, uh, the garbage collector will come in and, and deallocate integer 5 from the heap because it's no longer uh, being used or referenced by uh, the variable x. In C, however, it continues to point to the same allocated memory with a new value equal to 6. And then what occurs when x equals 10 and y equals 10? So like we showed in the example of both x and y had the same stack memory address pointing to the energy object 10 in a heap. But in C, x and y are two discrete variables pointing to two different memory locations. So you can kind of see the differences between the two in this simple table. But overall, the PMM handles many aspects automatically. We don't even know this is occurring. We, we never even know that this is going on um, unless we dug into it like we are now. So this is really beneficial to a lot of programmers where memory usage is not a, a huge, you know, glaring concern. Like myself, I wouldn't have actively, you know, tried to figure out where all these things were going and what was happening um, until I started this project. But on the other hand, on, you know, another note, uh, with C, as we show here, and as we're going to show, the ability to dictate where objects are stored um, allows that programmer to have pretty much total control uh, over the program and to actively optimize the efficiencies. And we'll, we'll just briefly touch on that for this, for this lecture. So sample C code. So in this example, all objects are allocated to the stack. We haven't, we haven't dictated, and again, this is C code. Um, we haven't dictated where if things are going to be put on the heap. But if we do that, we can see how the code changes. Um, we have some pointers in here where those asterisks are, are noted. Um, but pretty much everywhere you see malloc, that is where objects are being allocated to the heap actively. The programmer says, I want it put in the heap. I don't want it in the stack. And we also have these commands called realloc, and then we have free. So free is very important in C because uh, that deallocates the objects from the heap. So what the garbage collector in the PMM was doing automatically, C, you have to do it this way. If you allocate in your program or your function, you must deallocate. Um, there's no garbage collector. And if you don't deallocate those objects that are no longer being used or called on, you have the risk of memory leaks. So these, these things are just living there, consuming memory, uh, where, and not doing anything. They're taking space that something else could be using. So you have to be mindful of that and see. So what's next? <clears throat> How do we help the programmer see what the PMM is doing? How can we help them do that? How can we improve memory allocation control similar to C? Now, we can't actively dictate where things are going to go because we've got that uh, the Python mem memory manager. But we can help the programmer visualize what's going on. So that's where we enter the memory visualization tool, or memviz. So the simple diagram kind of shows the, the breakdown of what we're going to do a live demo of coming up here. So we have a program. It goes through the memviz tool. 
you get a printout or a visualization of what's happening in memory, uh, you know, showing the size, where it's being allocated, stack or heap, and the addresses. Um, so just like we showed in those, those quick examples early on, this tool will do that all automatically and in real time for your input code. So I use Flex to design a web-based graphical user interface. It's pure Python-based. Um, there's many types of widgets available within Flex, and I, I point out nine of the kind of the key ones that I've used thus far. Probably use a couple more of these as, as you know, before the final uh, date. Um, but overall, the tool will uh, allow the user to copy paste their code into an input box with interactive buttons. You can toggle up and down several functions. It'll have a pre-processing logic that'll parse the code that's input, sift it for function calls, variables, etc. cetera. Uh, after it's pre-processed, the user can toggle up and down their script and see the memory usage size, the allocation type, the memory address in the stack, and it'll all be visualized just like the examples we showed. So we also use dynamism to set up the, the button clicks and the preprocessor logic to act simultaneously and to interact with different input sources. So we integrated several decorators and context managers to accomplish, it, accomplish this. Um, so let's have a look. Let's do a live, de live demo. Okay, so now we have the code here um, for the final project, this UI.py. UI we have several other um, py, uh, Python files here that will eventually tie all, everything together, but this this UI.py has a primary, the main class here <clears throat> called code memory, which is driving the widget and the uh, preprocessing code, preprocessing code all at once. So these first several lines here, you can see a lot of these widget calls. Uh, the input box here, multi-line edit progress bar, which you can see um, actively uh, how you're progressing through your code line by line. Uh, the different buttons. Um, then we have this memory window. So this is where um, the actual, you actually be able to see the stack frames popping, you know, being pushed and popped and seeing the heap grow and shrink as functions are completed or, or run. Uh, then we have our, our several decorators here that, that interact uh, with the buttons and the the um, compile code or the preprocessing code um, as they're going. So these are all run uh, simultaneously as the compilation is being done. <clears throat> so I'm not gonna get into too deep of detail with the code here, this is still in process. We, I hope to finish this up, um, you know, before the uh, the final due date. Due date, uh, but this is the current status. Uh, just briefly overview. But let's take a look at the actual flex, um, the web-based uh, widget that is that runs off of this here. So I have it set up in a pip environment. We can go ahead and run this here. <clears throat> so here we go. Now. Uh, in PyCharm, it kicks off a Firefox window. Um, that's just because that's it's what I have PyCharm set up right now. Uh, but we can use Chrome. We'll just click on this local host. Um, and right now, so index of available apps. So here's our code memory. We'll click him. And then you'll get this, this user interface window. So on the left, you can see copy and paste your code here. So you can say, you know, def uh, func a b. And then you can put... Right now, I don't have it set up to inter interpret tabs, but we'll get it there. X equals one, and then we have, <clears throat> oops, so here, one, two, three, four, turn. Of course, I can't type when I'm on the screen. Return X. There, so we can do something silly like this. Um, and then there's a submit button. So what submit does currently, it takes whatever you put in here, compiles it. And um, we'll go back here in this window. And right now this is, you know, new JavaScript um, lines. And what I've got it parsing is we're trying to parse out both the, the area that says def. So that tells us, okay, we have a function call that's being, that's in the code. And then we can, we can parse out the arguments. And, and once we do this, this will tell us, uh, is a visualization going to put this in the stack area or is it going to put it in the heap area? And that's what this code is going to operate like. It'll tell us, it'll go through and chew through whatever code you put in and tell us, uh, you know, is it, a, is it a variable? Is it a function call? Is it something else? And, and do the visualization that, that's intended. So we'll go back to the window here. So we did that. Um, 
And then if we do next line, this, at the top, these will be the stack frames. So just like we showed in the example, we'll be able to click through these lines on the left and it will tell us the size and uh, reference. And at the bottom, it's very thin right now because we, I, we still, uh, you know, still working on this, uh, on this code to get the, the heap to grow and shrink as objects are allocated to it. But this heap will actually grow just like this stack stack goes up and stack frames go up and down. So this is currently where it's at. We and it took a while to get it where it is, um, but the the processing code is coming along nicely now. So hopefully by the 16th it will be able to um, parse more complicated um, uh, objects and, and functions and things in the the upper left uh, the, uh, the left uh, side box. So that's essentially where it's at. Um, I do have it set up to run through Travis. Um, so I'll just briefly show that now. So it does the develop branch. It's running, uh, you know, it runs through fine. I just have a really simple test that goes through to make sure everything's working. However, when I, when I pull this thing into the uh, main branch, it's not master in this case, um, it does, it will start the Flex app. I just do not know how to get it to stop once it's confirmed that it's, uh, that the Flex um, widget is open. So I just have to cancel it every single time. But other than that, it's running. Uh, here's the GitHub uh, location. Um, so you can you can run through here. I have a little bit more detail in the README document. Um, uh, some of the project deliverables here are shown. Um, and then we can go back to the uh, presentation and just do a really brief summary. So now that you've seen the interactive tool uh, and where we're heading with this and have a hopefully a better understanding of the Python memory manager, um, it does a great job so we don't have to do all that that, that back-end work and cleaning things up and making sure that we have you know the right amount of space to run our program. Um, it removes a lot of additional code and responsibility from the programmer. Garbage collection removes the risk for memory leaks um, like, like I said, C requires a more advanced grasp of memory allocation, and, and Python handles it for us. The MemViz tool, it's a flex-driven UI widget, um, and hopefully it will aid Pythoneers to understand memory allocation as they develop their code. Uh, we use uh, you know, advanced um, techniques like decorators, context managers to drive the logic in the user interface. Um, it's user it will be user-friendly uh, once we get it, everything up and running. Um, it's simple to use and, and, and has an easy to understand feedback. It provides another level of insight to a programmer that wasn't available before. So next steps, um, as of 12.6, the current version of the MemViz tool is still a work in progress, just like I showed. Um, the pre-processing uh, functionality hopes to be expanded by 12.16 due date. Um, hope to include coverage for most objects and calls and visualization for them uh, can be of course, this tool can be greatly expanded to auto parse for an entire Py file instead of having to copy paste. Um, and there's other UI tools besides Flex out there. Flex is actually kind of, uh, it's not the easiest thing to use, um, but it's, it's, it's working so far. And we can also add functionality to write a summer file report and other things like that. So uh, without that, uh, that's my project, and I hope you enjoyed. Thank you.